Here, and warm welcome to this webinar, Setting Up a Successful Mediation Business. I hope you can all hear me okay. My name is David Little and I'm the CEO and the founder of a fantastic organisation called the TCM Group. It's our 15th birthday this week, um, so we've been working in the area of dispute resolution for what feels like a very, very long time. And um, I'm hoping to share with you today some of my experiences of setting up a mediation business and running it for 15 years. And let's not forget that at least half of those 15 years have been spent in one of the deepest recessions um, in, in a generation. It's been tough times. And I've been selling services, I know a number of you do also, that people don't understand. They still don't get necessarily what mediation is. People still wonder if I'm going to sell them some medication or take them on a meditation journey. And um, it's been tough. It's been a but it's been a tough 15 years. So I was reflecting on on the webinar today. I thought, well, what do I know about setting up a successful business? And I think making it through 15 years and influencing the changes that we believe we have influenced, and working with HR directors, working with business leaders, working with union officials, working with others within organisations, but predominantly working with parties in a dispute. They are telling us that what we're doing as mediators and in, in general and, and at TCM in particular is very special. It's very unique. It's, it's innovative. It's creative. It's bringing people together during the really tough times and helping them to find a satisfactory and meaningful outcome to their, to their quarrels, their differences, their, their disputes, their conflicts, uh, whatever, whatever it goes by. And for me, success is born out of making a change and a difference, a, a transformation, not just in the in the big picture, you know, changing the way that Royal Mail handles its industrial relations affairs, which clearly is a, is a wonderful achievement for us at TCM. But every time myself, my team, my consultants go out and work with the parties in a difficult situation and help them find a, an outcome, a, a, a different way of working, that for me is the true mark of success. And even talking about it now, it thrills me, I'm passionate about it, it excites me, and it's something I believe very, very passionately and we need a lot more in this country. We need a lot more opportunities to sit down and have conversations. And of course, as we're approaching the, the referendum tomorrow, we've seen some of the most bitter and, uh, and divisive language and, 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 and difficult uh, difficulties in the way that the, the two parties have been expressing themselves. And it reminds me really of how quickly conflict can become destructive and divisive and also how much that sets the tone for the way that many others view conflicts. And there's a lot of work that we need to be doing as mediators, facilitators, as consultants to help to generate an environment and create an environment, a successful environment where mediation, cooperation and collaboration trump division, dogma uh, and the kind of uh, language and mindsets that we've seen developing in relation to the EU referendum in general and also in terms of some of the other disputes that we're seeing in the news on a regular basis. So let's begin and um, people often say to me, what, well what is TCM? So TCM, Total Conflict Management. Now, I set TCM up 15 years ago, June 2001. I was sat in the back of my MBA class learning about total quality management. Prior to that, I'd been running a mediation charity, or I was still running the charity. Uh, I'd set that up in um, the early 90s, in 1993. And we've been working in the areas of uh, neighbour dispute mediation and large community disputes. I set up a program called CRISP, the Conflict Resolution in Schools program. We're doing work in the areas of restorative justice, victim offender mediation. We're doing some really interesting work about embedding the principles and the, the, the philosophy of nonviolence and cooperative problem solving within some pretty pretty difficult uh, community disputes. I was a huge fan of integrated approaches. I don't, I didn't believe, and I still don't believe in the idea of a diplomatic service being parachuted into a dispute to help them find a solution. I believe that most human beings uh, have the capability and the capacity to resolve their own issues and it's more about helping to create the systems, the structures and the processes for people to find a solution. So on one level my belief was much, very much aligned to 
the notion of the integrated conflict management system. And some of you will be aware of some of the, the research that's been done in the States in relation to the integrated conflict management system. I'm a huge fan of that. And then I learned about total quality management and the notion of um, uh, holistic quality system, quality circles, quality processes that work across the whole of the organization involving all stakeholders. And I was really bought into the notion of TQM and total quality management as, as an approach for driving quality uh, within, within the UK. And we were looking obviously at Japanese models and other models and how they benefited the UK industry and manufacturing. I was a great fan of TQM. So I simply sat in the back of my MBA class and put my integrated conflict management systems with total quality management and, and, and then we saw the, the formation of total conflict management. Given that I could have called my company happymediationservices.com or UK best mediators in the, in the whatever.co.uk, I probably made my first branding mistake coming up with a fairly abstract mouthful like total conflict management. So for those of you who know us, we shorten that to TCM. But the principles I wanted to share today, because the principles are important, it's about what we believe in and what we see as being critical in terms of our vision for effective dispute resolution. And it's about embedding and integrating the, um, the principles of nonviolence, collaborative approaches, cooperative approaches to dispute resolution, predicated on two very simple factors, that when we're in a dispute, the best way to resolve it is to sit down, to talk, and listen. And again, if you've sat on any of my webinars or been at any of my presentations, you'll know that organizations are really good at putting in enormous blocks and barriers to those two simple fundamental basic principles of dispute resolution, talking and listening. And part of my 15 years in, in, in running a business has been about going into organizations and instead of finding blocks and barriers for people talking and listening, it's removing those blocks and barriers and creating the conditions where talking and listening becomes the norm. And whilst it might roll off the, the, the tongue, <laughs> and it seems like pure common sense, it's like how can we not have an environment where people talk and listen? What we have seen over 15 years is that the cultures of many of our organizations draw on an adversarial justice model, that many of our human resources policies and procedures, employee relations, industrial relations, are intrinsically uh, adversarial, combative, and divisive that the ultimate outcome of the process is to identify a wrongdoer. It's about right and wrong, it's about rights, it's about winners and losers. And in actual fact, as a mediation business, I often think of myself more as a PR agent for conflict, going out and saying, actually, you know this conflict, it's not as bad as you might think it is. If you deal with it and manage it and work with it, you can get better outcomes. I think of myself as being a, a change agent in terms of changing the HR systems and processes and You'll know that we launched our model resolution policy a number of years ago, and that's now in place in a number of organizations, replacing the divisive and damaging grievance procedures which we've relied on for, for just too long. And of course, you'll know that we go out and we train mediators within organizations to help organizations and to create the conditions where when we're in a dispute, not if, when we're in a dispute, because we'll all experience it at some time, the opportunity is there for people to find a successful outcome. What we've also uh, moved into very recently as a business is the whole area of leadership and management development. We've seen firsthand what happens when leaders and managers avoid dealing with issues or when they deal with them in a clumsy or uh, an approach which doesn't demonstrate the compassion or the empathy which we know is important. In fact, it worsens the situation. We've often been there and have to go in and mop up the pieces afterwards. So we've developed our Leaders 2020 program to help organizations uh, develop the management and leadership capability to resolve issues at source, to nip problems in the bud, and create the conditions for dialogue and cooperative approaches on in the line. Really important because it's about being proactive, and it's about ensuring that managers and leaders are equipped for dealing with the tough stuff that our managers and leaders are being asked to do. I call it dragging soft skills into the 21st century. Soft skills have got a bad name for itself, and I think it's important that we revisit that. So what's, what's TCM, um, what's our story? So as I said, I started mediating 25 years ago. Um, uh, all, always in complex disputes, they were always complex. There was always uh, a level of complexity and challenge in the disputes that we were working with. But I saw mediation working in a, in, in, in a large number of those. In fact, over 90% of cases being successfully resolved through mediation. The last 15 years, of course, we've been spent working within organizations. 
I set up the FAIR mediation model, a, a very powerful model drawing on the best of all of the principles and approaches I understood about mediation, facilitate, appreciate, innovate, resolve. And that model is now used in over 4,000 UK companies uh, who have access to the FAIR model, who have trained people in the FAIR model. And that is most one of the most widely used models of mediation that I'm aware of anywhere in the UK and potentially globally, having a significant impact in organisations, and, and I'll talk about some of the examples. We set up internal mediation schemes. At last count, we've set up over 300 internal mediation schemes, often in larger businesses, but not always. We do work with smaller businesses, helping them to integrate and embed the approaches for dis dispute resolution and conflict management into their organisation, deeply uh, embedded and ingrained into their culture, value, mindset, principles, capabilities, systems, uh, and, and processes. It's been important for us as a business to apply a multidisciplinary mindset and approach. And what I mean by that is the first thing we do when we work with an organisation is we sit down with the key players, and the, excuse the jargon, the key stakeholders. Often it will start with the human resources professional, but then we sit down with the uh, unions, with management. I, I call these the triumvirate or the holy trinity, although someone did point out it's perhaps the unholy trinity sometimes. But we try and bring these key players together to help them work collaboratively to find um, better ways of resolving disputes for their members, for their employees, for their colleagues, for their peers. We involve occupational health, equality and diversity groups. So as a business, we're very keen to ensure that whoever, we're, whatever customer we're working with, we work across their business. And that's very powerful. It's, it, it, in itself, it's a very powerful approach because we often find difference and discord within those multidisciplinary groups that we can help to resolve and generate a clear strategic focus. We talked to market one of the first accredited mediation training courses, even before I'd set the, the business up, I was working with the Open College Network to accredit our national certificate in workplace mediation. Again, we've trained thousands of people through that course, both in our uh, training centres, but also when we've gone on site. And it's, it's one of our most profitable and one of our most effective uh, courses to date. And uh, it's incredibly popular and the feedback we get is absolutely fantastic. I think as a business in the 15 years that we've been working, we've, we've tried to ensure that mediation is an operational priority for HR, for managers, for others that I've mentioned, but also we've been very keen to get into the board and ensure that mediation isn't just seen as an operational priority, it's something that happens um, over there, it's something that we do as a business, it's embedded into our, into our, into our um, modus operandi is clearly stated in our employment packs and our induction processes. We celebrate the fact we have uh, mediation uh, within within our organisation. That's the level we want to be working at, and we're not comfortable unless we've been to the senior management team and, uh, and board and, and delivered a presentation about the impact mediation is having. We use an evidence-based approach in, in TCM, and you'll know, I'm sure, that we are very keen on gathering data and evidence about the use of mediation. And I think that's been very powerful because that's provided baseline measures and benchmarking uh, across organisations and within organisations so that they can measure the ROI, or as I've always called it, the ROM, the return on mediation. And those of you who are mediators now will know that we trade uh, in terms of the ethics, the morals, the values and the principles of mediation. But let's not pretend. One of the most important aspects of mediation is delivering value to the organisation, value measured in reduced time and reduced cost to the HR function, to the management function. And I think many mediators um, have, 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 have missed the importance of the measurement of value in terms of what they do. And I think TCM has stood out, uh, often head and shoulders. In fact, we would be described by Marks and Spencer's uh, employee relations manager as standing out head and shoulders above the competition. And I think one of the things that we do, it's not just because I'm six foot four, by the way, I think it's probably because we have really focused on ensuring we gather the data and we can demonstrate the impact of the work that we're having at a forensic level. And we have developed tools, calculators, and, and so on and so forth. I think the other thing is of the business, we work uh, very comfortably across all levels of the business, from the blue collar, the white collar, up to the board level. And I think that's a very important message that we take within organisations is we're there for everyone in the business. And uh, I think that's served us well over the years in working with a, a wide range of complex business environments from depots right the way up to the boardroom. And on Monday I'll be running a webinar on resolving boardroom disputes. 
We've also seen our, our approach uh, move into the employee relations space, the industrial relations space. I'd love to be there with Southern, helping them resolve their issues with the RMT. It's all over the news at the moment. But some of the uh, organisations we have worked with in the industrial relations space, particularly Royal Mail, but a number of others, have reported a significant reduction in industrial relations problems, strikes and, and ballots. So we've seen mediation moving not just as an HR function, but across the whole piece. We've also seen mediation, uh, and, and I think driven this at TCM, moving into the engagement space, the stress reduction space, into the uh, well-being, the whole well-being agenda. We've seen mediation be used to reduce attrition, i.e. number of people leaving the business. We've seen mediation being used to reduce absence. We've seen mediation being used to return people to work after sickness and suspension. So I think TCM has been very innovative and creative over the 15 years in helping organisations think about mediation more than just resolving a quarrel between two people in an office. I know a number of you are members of the Professional Mediators Association. I set that organisation up in 2007 and I'm very proud to be the president and actively involved in the PMA and the PMA and TCM work very, very closely together uh, to drive up best practice and uh, as you'll know the PMA is an independent company um, and is, 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 is um, had a number of uh, members from corporate organisations, mediators and mediation organisations all working together to drive up quality standards across the mediation profession. It's a fast growing and a fast paced organisation. I'm very proud to be part of that and I think it sent out the kind of message to the, uh, to the community that I personally and TCM generally are absolutely committed to quality assurance. And of course, as I mentioned, we launched Leaders 2020 in, in, in um, last year and we're doing a lot of work now around leadership and we're building a great relationship with the Institute of Leadership and Management, ILM, as well as other organisations. And uh, we've just launched a new brochure for Leader 2020. So that's a little bit of a reflection on the 15 years. I think in terms of trying to share some of the success, I don't know, it's like there isn't a single thing I can say to you now that has made us successful as a business. I think it, it, it's, it's all of the above. And I'll go into, I've tried to, I've tried to distill in success into kind of five key areas and five key, five key things. But I think it's about trying to do all of those things and doing them in a way which is credible and being seen to be credible in the eyes of the decision makers uh, within the organisation. And these are just some of the organisations that we've worked with and are work, or are working with to, to promote better dispute resolution. But, you know, our client list really is a who's who. Of the, of the world of blue chip and large corporates and we've worked across government departments, we set up the Department for Work and Pensions Mediation Programme, we've worked in many of the, the banks and financial organisations in the city, within Royal Mail probably one of our biggest pieces of work, uh, setting up their uh, bullying and harassment mediation programme and their industrial relations programme and I still have one of my team seconded into Royal Mail running their mediation team and uh, it, it's been uh, for me an, an internationally important piece of work. Network Rail, we've done a number of pieces of work with them and continue to do so in terms of embedding a mediation program. And of course, Lloyd Bank spoke at the Re Redefining Resolution Conference back in February, talking about savings in their business of introducing resolution uh, issues resolution in terms of the millions of pounds. This is These are big organisations talking about mediation. And TCM, I think, is one of the few organisations in, in, in the UK and also potentially on a global level, having the kind of impact that we have in some of these household names. This is just some of our brochures, Leader 2020, our TCM Plus, which is our um, uh, subscription service for organisations used, used predominantly by small businesses, but not, not, not always, and our, and, our courses, uh, and our services brochure. So this is just a little bit about, about us. So we take branding very seriously. We, we want to look good. We know it's important to look slick, smart um, to the outside world. So these are things that are important. They're underneath the surface, but they're very important in terms of how, how would people perceive the TCM group. So what do I think is uh, the essence of a successful mediation business? Well, this is just a little word cloud of some of the words that came to my mind when I was thinking about what, what's important to me as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, and if I was advising or coaching another business leader, what would I be saying? Well, I think the first one is you, you need to know what you're doing. You need to have expertise. There needs to be a depth of knowledge um, that you bring to your clients and can demonstrate that. 
There needs to be clear values. You know, what is it that you're about and how do you demonstrate those? You have to be resilient. It's it's tough. It's there's no question at all that selling mediation services is tough. Um, you know, people don't know they need it. If they do know they need it, they don't really want it. They're resistant to mediation. Yeah, you know, that's not certainly in two thousand and one that was very much the case. You know, I felt like I was fighting against a really strong um, tide uh, of anti mediation type approaches. And of course, you know, mediation now as, as we saw from the, the, the documentary that was on the T V yesterday, which I thoroughly enjoyed watching, um, about family mediation. It was some great insights into family mediation. But mediation now is 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 very much part of the mainstream vernacular and people are talking about it. It has a certain credibility and that's something I think is important. Building on the brand, building trust, having clear systems, having courage to stand up and challenge the status quo. Uh, building strong networks, using evidence, bringing ideas, telling stories. These are all part, I think, of generating a successful business. And if you're working on your mediation business at the moment or thinking about setting up a mediation business, I think these are very important attributes for the entrepreneur to be considering in terms of how to create and sustain a successful mediation business which generates good revenues and ultimately generates good profit. And that's not easy. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, but one perseveres. So distilling that down into the five. So uh, I was hoping to be able to share with you in this webinar what I think are the top five most important attributes or ingredients of running a successful mediation business. Well, number one has to be credibility. You are only as good as your last mediation case um, your, your reputation, in my experience, is everything. And if your reputation is based on being an expert in your field, highly knowledgeable, generous of spirit, generous of sharing that, then that gains credibility. And that credibility cannot be bought. It can only be earned. And for me, the first thing I would advise anyone who's thinking of setting up a successful mediation business is how will you demonstrate your expertise and your credibility. I think that's about being part of organisations like the PMA, having all the, 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 the right training, um, really, really focusing on your own professional development. I, I, it, I, I, I fear sometimes of, of the lack of uh, professional development of, of some mediators. You might start talking about um, social psychology with, with mediators, which is an important aspect of being a mediator. And, and you can see their eyes gloss over and they don't, they don't understand the basic underlying theoretical frameworks that underpin mediation. So if you're going to sell mediation services, understand what mediation is and how it works, and that will gain you credibility. We have to be passionate, but it's, people are not passionate about conflict management. We are, we're mediators, we love it, it's what we do. But many people are not passionate about what we do as an industry. We have to make them passionate. And that's about going in and presenting and talking and being present in organisations when the difficult conversations are happening. And that's about, and often it's about going in and doing things free of charge. Um, you know, I, I think as an organisation sometimes we do too much free. We, we run webinars, we run workshops, we spend a lot of time on client sites and we're not charging for that. But the reason that we can rationalise that is because it's demonstrating our passion and we're there at the moment when the customer turns around and say they need us. The third tip is to absolutely be obsessive about the customer's experience. And that's from the minute they make contact with you, they start talking with you, they start viewing you online, they're looking at your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter profile, your website, they're talking to their colleagues, their networks. What experience are they getting? When they start to ask you for information, you know, do you keep your promises? It's absolutely vital that, that we, we keep our promises. Um, we, we, we meet the, the customer's expectations. And I guess as mediators, we are good at identifying what the needs of our customers are. If we're going to do that, identify what their needs are and then design and deliver services which meet their needs. And it, it's, it's not difficult. But again, I look at mediation practices and some mediators who get very upset that they haven't got enough casework. And I ask them to tell me, so what, what are the needs? What problems are you solving as a mediator? And they don't understand what I mean by that question. But for me, it's absolutely important. We need to know what problem we're solving for our customers. How are we delivering benefit from our customers? And as I was uh, saying to someone recently, I think we as mediators often talk about mediation as a noun. And I think it's a verb. It's about the doing of the mediation and it's about the benefits it has. And we should be talking more 
in terms of mediation of verb and the adjectives and the superlatives, what benefits does it bring? We need to move away from mediation and the features. So for those of you from sales and marketing, you'll know features, advantages and benefits. Stop, let's stop talking in terms of features and really start talking in terms of advantages and benefits. We need to build a strong brand. You know, for those of you who are starting off, it's difficult. It's difficult. You know, there are big players in the market, TCM amongst others. How do you build a brand that stands out? There's no easy answer, um, but it, it's about having a strong brand name, a strong logo, and being absolutely committed to it, and, and, and being clear in your own mind. What do you want your brand to stand for? What messages do you want people to receive when they look at your logo, when they receive emails from you? And being clear in your own mind that your brand has a uh, will generate an emotional response, and you want that emotional response to be positive, and that people will feel aligned to what you're trying to do. And building a brand as a I'm, the, I'm no brand am, expert, but I know I take branding very seriously. I don't. We don't get it right all the time, and sometimes we get it very wrong. Um, but I'm aware of it, and I think it's important to, to, to be aware of it also if you're going to be successful. And finally, the fifth piece of uh, ingredients to this uh, delicious meal, I guess, is having a great team. Now, some of you, or many of you, are, 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 are freelancers and consultants, and may not be able to build a team around you. But certainly for me at TCM, one of the greatest strengths, in fact, not even the greatest, one of the strengths, the biggest strength, the most incredible strength in, in, in the TCM business is the unbelievable team that I have around me working with me and working with each other. And yesterday was our birthday party. It was also one of our colleagues uh, was getting married uh, on, on Friday. And I was just there for this. I was, I was part of it. And it was unbelievable, the, the, the buzz, the camaraderie, the, the, the supportiveness, and it, was, and it reminded me of what an incredible team. And then, But that team are also delivering incredible value to the customer and building a strong brand, they're building the reputation. So I could probably argue that having a great team around me should be number one. Um, but it's such important. I'd like to say thank you now on our 15th birthday. I'd like to use this opportunity to thank my team um, for being brilliant, simply being brilliant. And these are our values, and I talked about the importance of values, so don't underestimate the values. Now, if you're going to go into an organisation, one of the first questions I would ask when I'm working with an organisation to consider setting up a mediation programme is what are your values? And if you haven't got a clearly defined set of values for your own organisation, it's very difficult then to align your values to their values. But if you can match your values to the organization's values, you get a fit. And organizations don't buy, they do buy on quality, of course they do. They buy on price, of course they do. But what they're really buying on is, could I work with this person? Could I trust this person? Could I have a long-term relationship with this person? It's all about the relationship. And if you have a clearly stated, even if you're a freelancer and a sole trader, having a clearly stated value set of values that the organisation can then make a decision based on you and the relationship with you, I think it makes it all that bit easier. And we are very much drawn to and focused on values within the TCM group. Because it makes us better, they make us brilliant, they make us who we are. And I'm really passionate about them. And finally, have a lot of badges. <laughs> um, you know, go for awards, go for accreditations, and just go for it and get, get your name out of that. So I'll stop there, and I've got a, a, the second half of the presentation, I'm going to introduce you to an opportunity for some of you, if you're interested in working with TCM, there's an opportunity that I'd like to share with you and just start a conversation. But at this point, you see in your panel, there's an opportunity for, for questions, and I can see a number of you have asked questions. Um, so David, I'm curious to know whether you watched Call the Mediator on BBC2 last night. This is um, from Joanna, thank you. It didn't represent the advantage of mediation. I'm wondering whether the airing of such shows will turn people off as opposed to onto mediation, or is the fact that it's being aired in the first place a positive step? Thanks, Joanna, uh, for your question now. I think I've got Joanna and Elizabeth. So the question there is the, the, the call, the, call, call the mediator. Look, I think anything that gets the word mediation into the public um, mindset, I, re I read a review of it today online, and they, they, they call it one of the most depressing shows since... Um, uh, George Galloway on, on Big Brother did the cat impression. I thought it was a very, a very interesting analysis of the, uh, of, the, of the call of the mediator. But my view on it is slightly different. 
it's getting it out there into the into the mindset. I didn't buy into the mediation processes and necessarily how they were done, and obviously some of the issues were challenging. But that's that might be more about the editorial um, controls that were being set out by the um, the producers rather than the mediation process. I celebrate anything that puts mediation out there, generates a debate and generates a discussion. Was it mediation at its best? I don't think it probably was. Would I like to be involved in that kind of thing? I would. I remember going on to Kilroy. Do you remember Kilroy? Uh, I went on Kilroy twice. And the first time I went on to Kilroy, I was only in my early 30s, I think. And uh, Robert Kilroy Silk, who I'll never forget, uh, was there. And they'd had two warring families um, in the green room, uh, which is the room where you go before you go onto the studio. And they were getting them absolutely wasted. They were filling them with drinks. It was a free bar. And they were really encouraging them to drink. And then they went out into the Kilroy studio. Kilroy just basically generated so much heat, he was really antagonistic. And then he turned around to me and said, David, mediate that on live TV. And I remember thinking to myself, yikes, what do I do? I tried my best. But if you look back at it now, I probably cringe with embarrassment. So I wrote a letter of complaint. I uh, felt like it hadn't been handled properly. And I was invited to come back. And the second time I went back, they uh, set it up properly. I had a proper little space to do the mediation. There was no alcohol. I insisted there was no alcohol in the green room for the parties. I set out the conditions. I was invited back. The second time was fabulous. Now, I'm sure my mum's probably got a video of that somewhere. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's, we have to control the, try and control the media a little bit as well and make sure that our narrative and story is told effectively through the media. And that's something I'm really keen to do. So thank you, Elizabeth and Joanna. I'm sure it wasn't mediation at its best. Um, but nonetheless, I'm, I think it's valuable. Any other questions about mediation? Anyone got any thoughts or questions, reflections they'd like to ask me about 15 years of, of running a mediation business? Any do's, don'ts, tricks of the trade, little uh, trade secrets? And I say I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you do have. Um, and I'll keep an eye on the questions box as it's coming, as, as we're going along. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just move into the second part of the webinar. Um, so, Rebecca, so you, is there anything you would choose to do differently? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what would I do differently? I guess I wish ACAS were more collegiate and more cooperative. I remember there was a review, it's called the Roots to Resolution Review, and there was a couple of reviews. And I wish that I had more, I guess it came to my, my, my ability to influence government policy. I suppose in that sense, I wish I was the Prime Minister. Um, I wish the government and ACAS had been more collegiate and had been more open to the private sector and recognised there was a lot of very good practice in the private sector. And ten, 10 years or so ago, there were some really pivotal moments before the dispute resolution regulations came into effect. And obviously then they were repealed and we saw the ACAS code. But for me, there was an opportunity for the government to embrace the work we were doing in the private sector and to work with the private sector in a more of a partnership. And, those opportunities, and I wrote to ministers uh, about this and my view that the government should be encouraging more of a cooperative approach between ACAS and the private sector. And it was pretty much ruled out. And to this day, my biggest regret is that, you know, we have this big brand called ACAS, well respected, and, you know, I've got a lot of respect for it as well, in, in fairness. But there isn't the perception that there is a, a, a coherent and organised ADR, alternative dispute resolution and mediation profession. And I set the Professional Mediation Association up to try and ameliorate that to an extent, and I think I've had some successes. But if I'd have done things differently, I would have probably lobbied harder for there to be a, a greater relationship between the state and the private sector. And I think had we done that, we'd have seen mediation grow much more rapidly because we, we in the private sector and those of you who are out there doing it in voluntary and not-for-profit and also freelancing are doing some amazing work. But it sometimes feels like it, no one notices and no one really cares and we're not sort of joined up. And I, I regret that. Richard, you've, you've mentioned, I found it difficult meeting or networking with senior people within potential client organisations. What is the way forward? I found it difficult meeting and networking with senior people. Okay. It's, uh, Richard, evidence. It, it's, um, it's about gathering evidence. 
and presenting that evidence and telling a story. There's some great stuff online about storytelling, Richard, and I'm a great believer in storytelling. I love a good story. Um, and I love telling stories from being a, being a father. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than that nighttime story with my kids, but also telling a story as a business. And I think people respond very positively to stories. And so, you know, go in and tell your story. Gather evidence. Don't make wild assertions. We see these wild assertions. 86.7% of mediation cases last for 12 months. I, I, I hear really wild assertions being made. Underpin what you're saying with evidence as best as you can and tell the story and just keep knocking on that door. Don't ask for an hour with the board. Don't ask for 50, 30 minutes with the board. Don't ask for 15 minutes with the board. Just ask for five minutes to go in and tell your story. And someone in that boardroom will listen to you telling their story and they will your story and they will be inspired by what you're saying and you'll get an email the next day saying, look, can we go for a coffee and talk about it? And it builds momentum. And I would suggest it's about activity. You know, you can eighty percent of your activity may result in, in, in nothing. Maybe ninety percent of activity, ninety five percent of your activity may result in nothing. And you could argue there's a lot of activity has to happen. But without the activity you can't build the momentum and it's the momentum that builds the success. So you have to do the activity, even if you don't, you can't see the direct correlation between the activity and success. And basically, it's just throwing yourself at it, making yourself known, and keep banging on the door and being resilient and keep persevering. And you know, dare I say it, just don't give up. You've got a great story to tell, and don't give up and have that self-belief. Um, I, I guess I do have that sense of self-belief. I'm not saying I find it easy, and sometimes. You know, I, I, I wonder what I could do more of, but I do believe in the message and the power of the message. And the reason I do that, Richard, is because when I look into the party's eyes after I've done a mediation with them, I know something special has happened that hadn't happened prior to that. I've done something that wasn't happening in that organisation. And if I can take that message into the higher echelons of the organisation and begin to systematise that and institutionalise what I've done, then I believe passionately, and the evidence supports this now, that the organisation can transform its culture and values, and that is a deep belief I have and a deep passion I have. Um, I, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, keep going, keep going, <laughs> keep on going is my advice. Thanks, Rebecca, Rebecca, for your comment. So the other thing I wanted to, to announce really was was an opportunity for those of you who might um, broadly describe yourselves as mediation entrepreneurs. Uh, TCM in, in July will be launching a franchising uh, opportunity across the UK and also uh, on a global basis in, in 2017, but for 2016 we're opening up opportunities for people to buy licences and franchise with the TCM group. And I'm announcing this, is the first time I've announced it, I'm using this webinar as an opportunity to announce it. For those of you who are not interested in this, I will not be at all, um, uh, I won't take the offended if you don't stay on the webinar, but for those of you who might be interested in finding out a little bit more about what TCM is doing and opportunities to be involved, I'd just like to spend five minutes, if I can, talking this through with you. If you're interested, contact me afterwards. I've got a lot more information that, that isn't here, but this is just giving you a feel for it. So I'm setting out opportunities now for people who wish to become TCM uh, franchises. This is an opportunity for them to, to get involved. To get started, we will be franchising um, our two-party mediation services using the fair mediation model, which I know a number of you are trained in already. If you're not trained, we'll train you. Team facilitation and team conferencing is an incredibly lucrative and profitable activity. You'll have access and, uh, and be able to deliver the Open College Network accredited National Certificate in Workplace Mediation. You'll be able to offer that on an open access basis in your locality, but also go into businesses and deliver that to, uh, to your clients. You'll be able to deliver our Practical Mediation Skills course, which is a two-day course, which is incredibly popular and, again, incredibly profitable. Core Mediation Skills is a one-day course uh, that's used for uh, training line managers and others within the organisation. Again, a very, very popular course and very profitable. And also, you'll be able to deliver our entire suite of Mediator Continuing Professional Development courses. All of those are delivered in partnership with the PMA. So in the first instance, we're offering opportunities for people to run T office, TCM offices in their localities across the UK, delivering our well-respected and high-quality mediation services. 
People can then uh, opt into additional opportunities. They may do so at any time through the franchise. They can also do it from the beginning. Um, and that includes workplace investigations, incredibly uh, lucrative piece of work, but a little bit more complex. We will provide training for you if you're interested in doing workplace investigations. And that's in relation to bullying, harassment, misconduct, um, whistleblowing, amongst others. Our resolution audit is the uh, toolkit that I've designed, which is about gathering evidence of the need for a shift in the culture and the, uh, the, the approach within the organization. And that comprises a number of toolkits gathering quantitative and quali qualitative data, and also includes templates for developing business cases for internal mediation schemes. Dispute triage, some of you may be familiar with, also known as early neutral evaluations. Uh, we train HR shared services and HR professionals in how to spot uh, opportunities to mediate and to triage a case and identify the most appropriate route to resolution. We also provide an opportunity for TCM franchises to set up internal mediation schemes of the kind that we've set up in Lloyds Bank, in Royal Mail, in EDF Energy, and we will provide all of the templates, the software and training on helping you set up internal mediation schemes in your locality. We'll provide opportunities for you to deliver leadership and management training using our Leader 2020 branding and our on the 16 modules in Leader 2020. We expect this, it's only just been launched, but it's been incredibly popular. We expect this to become a major part of the TCM brand in the next two to three years. And we'll also provide our access to our full portfolio of short courses. In essence, the opportunity for a franchise to start with our mediation services, which we know are tried and tested, come in at a low level, get started and in essence to grow the franchise so you're running every single aspect of what we do in london the tcm offices in islington will retain the uh, will be the head office and uh, will be the london franchise so we're not looking for franchises in, a, in and around london i know a number of you are based in london but the tcm islington office will be the london franchise but we will be looking for franchises outside of the greater london area i know that might be uh, disappointing to some of you in as much as I know some of you are London based but we aren't looking to set up an additional London operation at the moment but we are looking elsewhere. So this is the area that we'll be looking for um, uh, across the UK as I said we, are, we will also be looking at international franchises predominantly in Europe and in the States to start with and that work has now begun and we are in talks with the UK Trade and Investment to support us on an international franchising program. I have a, a franchise consultant who is supporting us as well in terms of this and Mark, um, I understand that you're on the webinar, uh, very, uh, very warm welcome to you and uh, Mark will be supporting us with the franchise and doing the franchise agreements and all of the uh, documentation. So we'll be providing franchises uh, in, in, in geographies and these are some of the jobs that will be done on a county basis. Each county will have a TCM office in the uh, largest urban conurbation, possibly, or wherever you're based. Um, the, uh, there's very little um, setup required. You would have full access to our website and all the materials that we have. In fact, let me go through that with you now. So if you did decide you wanted to run a TCM office, uh, you'll have access to TCM's 15 years experience and our reputation. You have full templates and training for all products. You have our, our brand profile, so the TCM logo and all associated materials you'll be able to have access to. We're in the process of updating our website. We have a WordPress website which um, uh, will be updated. In fact, we're just in the process of beginning that, that, that exercise. It will become an international and national website designed specifically to support those of you who are running franchises. And I'm making a commitment that at least 50% of all capital raised in the first five years of franchising will be reinvested back in to brand building and PR. So we're going to make a massive investment into brand building and, and PR, which will then support all of the franchisees across the UK. We've got a fantastically well-developed back office function at TCM, managed by Lisa, our commercial manager. That includes finance. We have our, all of our finance systems, our exemplary. We use salesforce.com, our CRM system, and of course we have a, a Paxio, which is our internal mediation scheme. We undertake extensive marketing and PR. You will know that already from the fact you received an email to come onto this. We'll be doing a lot more on the marketing and PR over the next two to three years. And as we build more franchises, that will give us more working capital to invest more in the marketing and PR. 
You'll have access to TCM's network of partners, I should say, including the CITD and ILM, amongst others, and full access to the Professional Mediators Association, which is rapidly becoming the quality assurance and regulatory body for mediators in the UK. You'll have an annual franchisee meeting where we'll get all franchises together. My hope is to develop a, 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 a very a collegiate approach to franchising where we're sharing ideas of, uh, amongst ourselves. Clearly, we can do that online, but once a year, all franchises will come together for a full day and we will have a conversation about what's working and what are the challenges. We will run a quarterly on-site review meetings. That will be with me personally. I will come to you for a full day and just work through the challenges and the issues that you're facing and try and answer any questions that you have. And we'll also run a franchisee helpline, which will be staffed by myself and all of the resolution consultants in TCM, whereby any questions from franchisees are able to be answered quickly and efficiently to give you the best support. We will throw support at each franchise to ensure that you have everything that you could possibly need to uh, run, the, run the franchise and run it effectively and efficiently and build up a really, really strong name and a reputation. We will also be giving uh, each franchisee discretion on pricing. So if you're based in uh, a particular area where there are already um, freelancers, we cannot compete. One of the reasons I'm doing this is I cannot compete with freelancers across the country because of the low overheads. We'll be given large dis uh, discretion on pricing across all products for franchisees, so you're able to compete on a local basis. So rather than uh, having to follow the TCM pricing model, which obviously is based on a large overhead and a large London office, um, which means we can't afford to necessarily compete with the pricing in, in, in Bristol and Sheffield with some of the local uh, consultants, we will give uh, um, discretion on pricing, which means you can be very competitive on price. So in essence, you would compete on quality with the branding, you would compete on price with the ability to have discretion on pricing, and you would compete on value because of the amazing work we do on return on investment. You would also have all of the relationship building activities that we've done as a business. You'd have the relationship um, added value, the pricing added value, the quality assurance added value, the branding added value, and the locality added value. So we're expecting, and we've run the, uh, we've run the numbers through, for um, the vast majority of franchises, we would expect them to be breaking even within the first eight months of being set up. Now, for organizations setting up from new, uh, the break-even could be anything 36 months plus. So we're seeing the franchise break-even being very, very much, more, uh, much quicker. So that's just a taster of what we're planning. As I said, I hope that I've shared with you today the five key hints and tips that I've learned along the way in terms of setting up a successful mediation business, and I wish you the very best in, in doing that. If you are interested in exploring the idea of a franchise and want to have a conversation with me about franchising, there's my um, details. We'll be doing a lot of publicity about franchising. We're looking at a number of people to come on. You would be, if you did come on now, you'd be uh, one of the early adopters. We will be running discounts for the early adopters. In some respects, the early adopters, as you'll know, are also called guinea pigs. And um, so we will be running a uh, early adopter discount. So if you want to come on now, it's a great opportunity because we will be able to run uh, some really good offers to get the first three or four set up, and we'll be able to develop, to learn a lot from those. So it's never been a better opportunity to get involved with. I think one of the UK's and potentially one of the world's leading mediation businesses. But like I said, I hope I've shared some useful stuff with you today. I hope it's been valuable. Whichever way you go, I hope that you have a very successful business. We're doing amazing work, and I think together uh, we, we can do so much more. And I hope that we can continue this conversation. I've got another webinar I'm running on Friday, which is launching a white paper. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do uh, redefining resolution. We have some really interesting evidence and figures that have been gathered, which will be included in the white paper. Uh, so if you want to, that's 12.30. And of course, it's all part of our 15th anniversary week. So I'd like to say thank you very, very much for uh, coming along today. Uh, I've recorded the webinar, so this will be available on our YouTube channel as well. And I'd like to wish you all the very best and the very best of success with your business and your endeavours, wherever they might be. Thank you all very much for joining me today.